I want to start today with a question. What markers do you see in a person who is becoming more spiritually mature? That is, what do you see coming out of a person as they grow in their journey of faith? So I'm going to give just a moment for you to process that question and think on it. So in my experience, the answer to this question that I've heard over the however many the past years often is rooted in what somebody is doing, that the marks of spiritual maturity have to do with what somebody is actually doing in their day-to-day life. That uh, a spiritually mature person or a person becoming more spiritually mature looks like this, that they are doing more, they are serving more that they'll start serving not just in one place, but multiple places. They might be joining now children's ministry or worship ministry. They might be taking a a leadership role. They're taking on ownership. They're doing, doing more. Or they might be maturing by the fact that they're learning more. They're attending some of our classes or multiple classes, just as many as they can. Uh, Care ministry, love and logic, Bible study methods. They're they're studying, or maybe they're going outside. They're going to a Bible school. Uh, They're learning the original Hebrew and Greek in an effort to attain more knowledge. Or it's represented in what they do in their personal life. They stop listening to or watching certain things and start listening to other things. They start maybe tithing more and more, the giving of themselves. <clears throat> the, the list can go on. And all of these things, none of them are bad. They're all, they, they can be actually very good. There's nothing inherently wrong with them. But the act of simply doing isn't a marker of maturity. Doing can be uh, something that can help you become mature. It can be a reflection of maturity that's growing in you. But simply a checklist, it doesn't work like that. That maturity often isn't so much about what we're doing. It's about a mindset. At Family Church, we have what we call the spiritual pathway. It's a tool we use to help people assess where they are in their spiritual journey. That is, where are they as they're maturing in Christ? And in this pathway, we have four major stopping points. Seeker, student, servant, steward. And with each one, what you can do is see what a person at each point in this journey would look like. How they would talk, what they may be doing with their time, money, resources, uh, just how they live their life. But the real power, I believe, in the spiritual pathway isn't so much the four stopping points. It's the three points in between, these moments of transformation. These are the necessity, the necessi- necess- necessary excuse me, parts of spiritual maturity. They're from seeker to student, the, the most obvious and, and accepted one that you give your life to Christ. You make him your Lord and Savior. The ABCs, accept, believe, commit. But these other ones, after you become a Christ, as he's making you more into his image and likeness, these two are monumental moments in a person's life. And they're a continual. This isn't just you do it and then you leave it behind. None of these are are, are stopping point. We're always becoming more mature. But these two points are about a mindset. They're recognizing, one, the identity that you have in Christ. As a follower of him, you become more like him. He gives you a new identity. You, uh, th- there's a, marking, or a transformational moment when you stop looking after your own gains uh, and desires and plans, and you replace those with the desires and plans of God. And in these, you also start, in all aspects of your life, replacing lies with gospel truths. All of this, this journey of maturity, stems out of a mindset that we adopt, a mindset that is given to us by Christ. And so today, that's what we're going to be doing. We're going to be looking at what does it mean that we are being saved by the gospel? What is happening as we are maturing in our faith? And what does Paul have to say about that to the church in Philippi? So we're continuing our series. Uh, As we're looking through Philippians, we're going to be in chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it up. And I'm just going to dive right into it. He says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work 
for his good pleasure. And as I read that, and as people over history have read that, there's a part that just jumps out of people. Work out your own salvation. Out of this phrase, there has been over the years a lot of bad theology, a lot of outright heresy. Because when you read it at first glance, what it looks like is Paul is saying, uh, is teaching that there is now a works-based salvation. That you are saved by what you do, which comes in direct conflict with what the gospel teaches, what Paul has written about in all his epistles, that you are saved by grace through faith alone, that it is by Jesus Christ that we are redeemed, not by anything that you can do. He talks about this later in this letter. He talks about it all the time. You can't work your way to God. So what does this mean? We have to tackle this before we can move forward in this passage. Make sure we're all on the same page and understand really what is Paul talking about. And it really stems from this word right here. The issue comes from this word salvation. Because what we do in the church, and and I'm as guilty as anybody, I do this all the time, we use salvation and apply it to a specific part of our salvation. See, the salvation exists in three movements. There's actually three parts of salvation, past, present, and future. And what we often do is we use salvation and justification uh, synonymously. Justification is part of salvation, but it's not entirely salvation. And if we read this from the justification point, we run into massive theological problems of we have to work for our salvation. And so we need to tackle this. What are these three? What do they look like? So the first one passed. We are justified. We have been saved from the penalty of sin. Present, currently, we are being sanctified. We are being saved from the power of sin. And in the future, we will be glorified. We will be saved from the presence of sin. And so Paul, he's not talking about this justification. In fact, what he's written about so much is that justification, and this is really the gospel, what we teach. And so if you don't know this, you're not, you're not a follower of Christ, and you want to know more about this, because I'm just going to breeze over, find a pastor, sign, find somebody in, your, in this church, ask them more, because this is absolutely ne- necessary and a part of you, what you need in your life. Justification is the work of Jesus fully. He gives up heaven, God gives up heaven, comes down, lives on earth as a man, lives perfectly, dies on the cross, is buried, and is resurrected three days later, defeating both sin and death. And in this, what he does is he takes sinful people, followers of him, and he presents them to God the Father as justified. That is, we take on a legal standing where we are viewed as righteous. We are not righteous, right? But we are viewed as righteous because we're viewed through the righteousness of Christ. He takes on the penalty of sin, he defeats it, and he, and he shows us as righteous. He pays the cost for us. But Paul's not talking about the justification. What he's getting at is sanctification. This next part, the present part that you and I are all living in that we are being made more and more in the likeness of Jesus' righteousness. That we are becoming and looking more and more like Jesus. It's a part of our salvation, and in the end, our ultimate salvation, we will achieve it in our glorification. But it's a gradual process throughout all believers' lives where God is transforming you to be more like him. This is what Paul is talking about. And so when he's saying work out your salvation, he's really saying work out your sanctification. Become in the image of of Christ. And the problem is though still, if we look at this this first one, it's faith-based. This last one is faith-based. And this one really is works-based. We're still running into the issue because what he's really saying is join God. It's still about faith. We just now have a role in it. He starts off this passage, he says, therefore. So as we're looking at this, we need to remember, this is an entire letter. He's not just making a point, the chapters, the verses, they weren't all there. He's not just starting out of nowhere. He's been building this argument now for a a chapter and a half. And so when we understand what he's talking about, sanctification, we have to look back at everything he's been saying. He's therefore basically means because of this, do this. So he's saying because of what he talked about, we talked about last week, because of who Christ was and the sacrifice he made, the mindset he had that he was humble and self-sacrificing and that he was obedient to the point of death, 
Because of that, we have his mindset, we inherit it, and we can live humbly and lack self-ambition and conceit. We can raise up the interests of others in front of ourselves. And because of that, we can live unified and we can persevere through uh, persecution. He's building this up and he's saying, out of all of that, you are now working out your salvation. He says, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence. So here's Paul. Remember, he's writing a letter to a church that he's proud of. He loves them. He's encouraging them. He's excited how they are maturing. They are looking more and more like Christ every day. They are mostly a healthy church. They're not perfect, but he's proud of them. But in that, he's saying, therefore, as you have done, continue to obey. The commands he gave in the previous chapter, continue to obey them. And as you are obeying them, really the commands of God, you are working out your salvation. You are becoming more and more like Christ. And here's the deal. If Paul leaves it off right there, I have to say I would be terrified. Because even though I see who Christ is and what he's calling me to, that I'm supposed to inherit and become his righteousness, there's absolutely no way that's happening if I'm left to my own devices to work out this righteousness of Christ. Because in my sinful nature, I and you and I, we, we're so far from that. We are so very far. At my core sinful nature, I am uh, ill-tempered. I am grouchy. I just want to be left alone at times. I am greedy and lustful and and, and self-satisfying. I care for myself way more than other people. I look to my own interests. And when I hear all of that and I'm saying, I'm supposed to be the righteousness of Christ, all I can think of is that's, there's no way that's happening. You can't even get close to that. There's an old sports metaphor that, that, that just it makes me think of. This idea that you cannot polish a turd. That you can't make something good out of something that is so very far from it. It's just not going to happen. It never works. Because that's exactly what I feel. If I'm working out my own salvation on my own, I am left with fear and trembling in the sense that I feel like I just got to cower in the corner because I'm not going to make it happen. I'm not going to produce the righteousness of Christ. But here's the deal. This is starting to, to point to the power in which this happens. He says, with fear and trembling, it's not that cowering in the corner. It's fear in the sense of reverence and awe from a all-powerful, loving sacrificing God. Out of that, I can't help but want to, to, to work out this righteousness and this trembling. Again, not the cowering in the corner, but this idea that I am doing so fully knowing that I am incapable of doing it. And instead of stopping, looking to God as I strive forward, it's from, from this Greek word, traumas. That's what he's talking about. Recognizing who God is and the power that he has and that I can't accomplish him on my own. And so I start joining God in the work that he's doing inside of me. And he goes on and he finishes this part. He says, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the hope and the joy and the promise that he has. That yes, we are striving to obey but it's not through our own power. It is fully in the power of God working within us. He says both to will and to work, both to have the mindset, the willpower, and also the ability to produce the righteousness. It's not about what we are working on. It's about what Christ is, or God is working on inside of us. That he gives us this mindset, this will to be righteous, to desire righteousness, Because let's be honest, when we are sinful in our sin nature, we don't want righteousness. We want the farthest thing from righteousness. We want to self-serve. We want to be all-powerful. We want to look to ourselves. Really the closest, apart from God, we get to a desire for righteousness is false righteousness. A righteousness that says to the world, look at me, praise me, glorify me, serve me. The righteous God Righteousness God is talking about can only come from a desire from him. And so as well can only come an ability to accomplish it through him. 
that he gives us the ability to transform. He works inside us. He brings forth the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. It starts from him. It is empowered by him. He is moving it through us and out us, and we are joining him in what he is doing, and we are striving forward. In Colossians 1, Paul says, I am striving forward with all the power or all of his energy. It's all about God. He doesn't say you're on your own, figure it out. He says, trust in God, join him. And there's this last part that just I love. He says, to work for his good pleasure. That Paul is pointing to the fact that God, as he is working out this righteousness in you, as he is maturing you, he finds pleasure in it enjoy he's happy he's loving seeing what's going on and for a lot of us this really flips the picture of who god the father is that we view him often a lot of us uh, and, and i came from a catholic background so this really shaped it we view him as this distant mean uncaring dissatisfied really disgusted god who looks down at us and is like when are you just going to figure it out and instead, what Paul is saying is God's the opposite of that. He's close. He's personal. He's intimate. He's loving. He desires us to look more like him, and he takes pleasure in it. I just picture uh, a, a, us, me and my wife, with our daughter, Maria. She's now about eight years old. And we've got the pleasure of watching her grow up, mature from a baby to a young girl and eventually a young woman. And the whole along the way, it brings us pleasure. I just think of this, this, this is time when she was just a little one. I, I don't remember age. I'm really bad at that. She's just this little kid, and she's learning to talk. She's learning to potty train. She's learning all this stuff, and there's this, there's this day she goes into the bathroom, and she shuts the door, and Jamie and I, we're still at the stage where we have to help, so we both actually go in there, and here's Maria, little, little tiny Maria, sitting on her, her little potty, and she says, I need my private seat. And we're like, Jamie and I both look at each other and say, you need your what? She says, I need my private seat. And we're trying to figure it out. What she means is she needs her privacy. She wants to do her business on her own, by her own. And here's our daughter. She's stumbling through potty training. She's stumbling through words. She's saying private seat instead of privacy. She's stumbling through enforcing healthy boundaries. She's stumbling through learning how to do things on her own, her own uh, good independence. And we're not angry at it, like, how dare, you, uh, how dare you insult me? How dare I've had to wipe your bottom for so long, like, it's about time. No, 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 we're joyful and happy and pleased at the progress she's making. And it's just like God, he watches us mature and grow in Christ, and he's excited and happy for it. He loves watching it. He loves you, and he wants to see you and I grow in him. Paul's going to go on. He's going to touch now really on what it is, uh, a very tangible way in which we can live out this sanctification. He's really going to say, in essence, uh, sanctification is often about believing the gospel. So the second part of this passage, he goes on and he says, <clears throat> Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. He just goes straight into this, this, this really suggestion about how we start living and looking more like Christ. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. It's just a really great piece of advice. Uh, he's saying, don't be the guy who's always complaining about everything. Don't be the guy who's always uh, arguing just to make his point. Don't be that person. Nobody likes that person. They don't want to be around them. Don't be that. But he's actually getting to something more. He's getting to something much deeper in here. He's, he's really touching on the mindset that leads to grumbling or disputing. The action is just a reflection of what's going on internally. 
And so he's saying to the church in Philippi, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And he's saying, do all things. He does mean all things. We should not be grumbling or disputing. But he's certainly, in the context of what he's talking about, he's looking at the persecution he's experiencing. He's looking at the persecution the church in Philippi is experiencing. And he's saying, live through that, persevere through that without grumbling or disputing. Because grumbling and disputing uh, reveals what's going on inside your heart and your mind. It reveals a lack of trust in the gospel. It reveals a lack of trust in God. It reveals uh, that you are far from where he wants you to be. God wants our full trust in him. And when we grumble and dispute, both, this is both in, externally with other people and internally, what we're doing is saying that God is, doesn't care for us and he doesn't provide. And so Paul, right in this, this letter, he's been, actually been talking about this. He's already showed what this looks like in practice. If you go back to chapter one, which we touched on several weeks ago, he gives two examples of how this plays out in his life. He touches on the fact that he's imprisoned. And he, I have to imagine, Paul's not really happy he's imprisoned. I don't think anybody likes that they're imprisoned. But the mindset that he has in the face of his situation isn't a lack of trust, isn't grumbling or disputing. It's celebrating the work of God. That he's in prison and he doesn't go, oh man, get me out of here. Let's fight the Romans. Get me home. Uh, I can't stand this. He doesn't mope in the corner. He doesn't complain. What he does is he says that he is seeing the opportunity that he can proclaim the gospel even in his imprisonment. That his captors know that his imprisonment is for Christ and the people outside the prison are being emboldened by him. They're seeing how he reacts and they are joining in him joining with him in advancing the gospel. And then he gives this other one that there are people that are spreading the gospel out of bad motives. That they are somehow using it like to discredit Paul, to bring themselves up. And here again, Paul doesn't turn to grumbling or disputing, lacking trust. He says, hey, you know what? If the gospel moves forward at my expense, I don't care. They can slander me. They can say anything about me. They can have whatever motives they want. It doesn't matter because the gospel is advancing. And if Christ is winning, I don't care what happens to me. I don't care what happens to people's opinion of me. It doesn't matter. He trusts God fully in this. What he's doing really is he is recognizing lies that pop up in him and the church and he's replacing them with gospel truth. We have this cool tool we often use at Family Church, this idea that we replace unbelief with the gospel. That is, in all aspects of our lives, we increasingly, increasingly identify unbelief, and unbelief is a place where you know the truth about God, but you don't actually believe it in the sense of living it out, and you, you recognize it and you replace it with the gospel truth. That's what Paul's doing. He's saying, even though my circumstances are terrible— I fully trust in God that he is all-powerful, that he will use all things for his good. He trusts in him. And we can do the same. We can use this, like he's encouraging Philippi, we can use this in our lives. I want to give a very tangible example of this. As many of you know, down in green, we have an issue uh, right now. We have an issue because our building is up for sale. This building that we've been in for now close to 10 years, there is uncertainty about our future in it. That it is up for sale and there's the possibility that we buy it. There's a possibility that we extend our lease. There's the possibility that somebody else buys it. There's a possibility that at the end of February we have to leave. There's also the possibility that we buy another place and move in there. There's uncertainty about the future. And what we can do is recognize this uncertainty. And it's not wrong to recognize the reality of the situation. We are uncertain. But what we do out of that reveals something. If we panic, if we start complaining, if we start blaming God, how could you do this to us? We've been, we've been a church where you're a church and now you're leaving us hanging in the cold. If we start looking to him like you're not powerful, you don't know what you're doing, you're asleep at the wheel. When we start doing that, we start living in unbelief. And instead what we do is we replace that with gospel truth. 
We replace it with the truth of who God is. That he is all-powerful and all-knowing. That this wasn't a surprise to him. He knew before we ever moved into the building that in 10 years, we would be dealing with the sale of the building. We know that he cares for his people, that he is out for the interest of us when it aligns with his will and serves him. He knows what's going on, and we need to fully trust in him. He has a plan. He has a will, and it's our job to join him in it, not to worry about how he's not doing what we want. It's replacing, again, not just the unbelief with gospel truth, but really replacing our desires and plans with his desires and plans. And we can do this in all aspects of our life, increasingly trusting in God, attacking unbelief with gospel truth. He goes on to say that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation. And he's pointing to this, this sanctification process, this, this uh, transforming into the righteousness of Christ is doing something where you are, that it's revealing something, that as we look more and more like Christ, people are seeing more and more of Christ. They're seeing the gospel in action, in life. And what's really interesting is Paul here, he's actually referencing back to Deuteronomy. He's talking about the Israelites, referencing back to how they were constantly complaining, uh, grumbling and disputing that God rescued them from the Egyptians. He brings them (laughs) into safety. And all along the way, no matter the miracles, they keep complaining. God, you're not feeding us. God, you're not giving us water. God, you're not providing for us. Why would you do this to us? And he's saying, don't, act like that. Focus on the majesty and the glory of his miracles, not the present situation. What, Mo- what was happening in Deuteronomy and Exodus was God, through Moses, was teaching the Israelites what it meant to be a people of God. And here's God, through Paul, teaching the church in Philippi, teaching the church today what it is to be a people of God that we are to increasingly look like Christ, that we are to turn to him in all that we do and look to his truths and not the lies that come out of our situation. And he says, then among whom you shine as lights in the world. And here's what I love about this statement. He doesn't say, because of this, you may become a light in the world. He's pointing back to the truth of who we are, that we are lights in the world. He's pointing back to the promise of Jesus in Matthew 5, that you are a light in the world. He's pointing back to our identity. He's saying, you are a light in the world. So the question isn't, will you shine? It's how bright will you shine? Are we going to be a people who it looks like a bright, dist- or excuse me, a faded, distant star that gets swallowed up by the light pollution Are we a a star like the North Star shining bright through all things that guide people, that guide them not to us, but to Christ? He's saying, what what kind of star are you going to be? How are you going to allow God to transform you? The, The maturation that he's doing in you, the righteousness that he's building, determines the lumens as which you shine. And all of this, he's pointing again and again and again to identity. I love that this whole time he's saying, you are blameless, you're innocent, you're children of God, you're without blemish, you are lights in the world. This is who you are. And all of this sanctification, building and transforming into righteousness, it's what we call becoming who you are. This is the identity that God has already given us. And what we are doing is joining him as he is bringing that forth in us more and more. He's bringing that up out of us and into the world so that we can be a light in the world. And he finishes his part. Holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run it in vain or labor in vain. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. He finishes this part of the letter, and I love what he does. He just keeps bringing it back to Christ. 
He's talking about you working out your salvation. He says, just cling to Christ. Cling to the truth. Cling to the faith that you have been given. Cling to Christ, and he will keep bringing forth who you are becoming. And he finishes it off and says, really, he's, he's worried, not worried, but he's recognizing that his life is maybe coming to an end. And what does he find? He finds gladness and joy. He's saying, God is working in me. He's bringing about my ultimate righteousness and my glorification in the future. And in that, I find joy. And in uh, the church in Philippi, in you doing so, I find joy. What he's saying to them is to find joy in how God is working in you, to find joy in how Paul is seeing it working in himself, to really pointing back to God, join God in the pleasure of how he is transforming you how he's maturing you. And that's what he has for us. We should be finding this process joyful, even though sometimes it's incredibly hard. We should be finding it pleasurable and joyful. And so I have one last question for you. Are you finding this process, this transformation in your life, are you finding yourself joyful and glad in it? And if you aren't, I would encourage you to take a real hard look because what is likely happening is you're trying to will forth this righteousness on your own instead of trusting and joining God in what he is doing in you. I'm going to release the campus pastors. Love you guys. Have a great day. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, We have a couple questions for you in our transformational moment. The first is, where do you see God working in you? Where is God bringing forth the righteousness of Christ in you? Now, often we can look at the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. He's bringing forth these qualities within you, and they're uh, living out in the world. So how do you see God bringing forth himself out of you? And if you're struggling to know where that is, often it's where you are experiencing conflict and difficulty. That in there, God is using those situations to build something up in you. And last thing we have is, are others seeing his work in you? Is this now actually becoming who you are so much so that other people are seeing that, are seeing Christ in you? And if you want to get really brave, you can go ask a friend, a spouse, a child. Does he see, do they see the work of God in you? I love you guys. Talk to you later.